and more. Save 70% off on all fine gold, silver, diamond, and gemstone jewelry. Gifts for all occasions. All in-store, in-stock major appliances are on sale. Everything must go. Even the store fixtures are for sale. Only in the Sears store in Wasilla at 1000 South Seward Meridian Road. It's business as usual at all other Sears stores. Race fans, it's time to buckle in and listen to the fastest hour in racing radio. Your driver is a multi-time NASCAR winner and Hall of Famer, Mark Martin. We cover racing, grassroots, history, we bench race, we talk life, and most importantly, we smash the loud pedal. It's time to turn some laps on the Mark Martin Podcast. Episode number 32 of the Mark Martin Podcast, and today... We're going to get to some questions. We've gone up to 1990. We're going to take a stop and pause. We're going to answer the second some straight in-depth victory. questions that Hi, good everybody. I'm Wayne Kuyper with former 20-game winner Mike Krupko for do that, EA sure Sports to head over MVP to the website, Baseball. Mark Martin Pod. This matchup Com. features the Boston Red Sox Com. and the New York Yankees. Listen to the old episodes. Subscribe on your favorite player. And again, leave us that five-star rating. But Mark... We're going to have some fun today. We're going to do some fan oh, questions. Man. Here's yeah. the game's first okay. batter, Johnny So we got Damon. some questions coming in on the Twitter. And uh, also we have some email questions that we're going to get into. But, Mark, uh, we're going to start with a question that you pointed out. The first that was on the Twitter game. from this at Daniel Aldrich. Now, Daniel, he, he went kind of hardcore and asked a lot of questions here, which is super cool. Time. We're going to. We're going to touch on a couple of those questions. But um, the biggest one that, uh, that stood out to you, the temperature to reach the uh, his, his, his question, after you left Batesville, and kind of, you're kind of, you kind of broke away from your dad as far as, uh, quote, racing goes, you bring him he up occasionally where he oh, helped he a little here and there, he him get away. You weren't happy with his lifestyle choices at the time, at what point did that turn and improve with you guys? Okay, so this really refers to March of 79 when I loaded up the, the truck and trailer in our, uh, in our little race car and headed for Dillon's in North Liberty, Indiana. And, uh, yeah, you know, um, 78 was a tough season. Uh, the year before, and uh, my dad and I had been, uh, you know, it, it was a tough season. We raced for a championship out of Batesville, Arkansas, running ASA all up in the Midwest, a lot of travel. Uh, we managed to win the championship. It was uh, uh, a season where we had a little bit less uh, product right sponsor the backing the and so it you know it was uh it especially the engine program was a little bit of a drain my He's dad was fitting the bill the for that um, really he was trying to run his trucking that business really um, he was uh he was uh i was trying to run the race team he was trying to run, run his race uh run run the trucking business and he was, uh, he was seemed like he was running a little wild. He was a, a little off track with his life. Um, he, uh, you know, he was uh, drinking quite a bit. Um, and he was one of those guys that uh, when he overindulged, uh, you know, his he, he changed a good bit. And uh, he had also married... Uh, uh, his third marriage, uh, one of which I uh, didn't particularly approve of. I just just wasn't. He and I just just had a little bit of a rub. And I was 19 years old, and I really did want to be my own man, and I wanted to make things work my own way, and I wanted to be my own boss, and I and so um, I. Thought it was an opportunity for me to move to Indiana and and get out on my own, and so so I did. Um, and my dad was okay uh, uh, about it. You know, he may have been a little bit uh, 
bothered inside by the fact that, you know, that I wanted to get out and get on my own, but at the same time, he had to be also proud of me because I wanted to, um, you know, because I wanted to be my own man. And uh, he had uh, spent uh, 19 years raising me to be uh, a good man and someone who uh, handles his own business and, and makes his own decisions, it was time for me to, to fly the coop. So, um, you know, he continued to come to some of the bigger pit stop races, the three and 400 lap races. He would, he would come to those for sure. He'd usually bring Bill Davis along so Bill could, uh, could uh, gas the car. And, uh, you know, cause Bill Davis was working in a uh, tr trucking company office, uh, uh, with my dad with a uh, there at my dad's that place so right the uh, the the we continued to get along strike. great you know we, we got along good and got along better because I didn't have to see you know how he was living his life uh, and I could focus on what I was doing and, and uh, things really really turned for the better and I can't tell you what year it was but it was uh, the bottom of the first, it was a few the years um, after after this um, I'm going to say for the visitors, mid 80s and, here's a and look he, at he went into a uh, rehab center and uh, you know uh, gave up alcohol and uh, whatever drugs he might have been uh, partaking in and everything he went in for a year in Searcy, Arkansas. And when he came out, he was, uh, for the first time in his life, he was uh, clean and sober. And he was my dad through and through. Um, we, you know, developed a one hell of a relationship going forward. He's my hero, always was, before and after that. Uh, always going on. Even when I didn't approve of the way he was living his life, um, he was my hero and uh, always will be my hero. You need to be able to use the pad to advance the lot from the racing side of things. Questions from Matt Till, Tank 4 on Twitter. What's your fondest memory? Larry Phillips. The takes oh, my fondest second. memory is he gave me That's my first job. Choice. Other than washing trucks down at my dad's trucking company on Saturdays. And I only did that. I didn't get paid. I only did that because I got to, to drive them. Uh, in, I, I would take them around the block when I finished uh, washing them instead of back them back in their spot. I'd take them around the block and back them in their spot. So, uh, Larry gave me my first job when I didn't deserve a job. I was racing against Larry every Friday and Saturday night uh, and in Springfield, Missouri, in Port Smith, Arkansas. Larry had built us uh, a dirt car in 76, late model. Um, and uh, so we knew Larry well, and we raced against him um, all in the spring of 77. Um, and when I graduated high school, uh, I hit him up for a job. He had Larry, you know, Larry Phillips' performance, uh, whatever it was that, you know, built parts After and sold parts and York, whatnot. He didn't have very many people working there. Um, Mahomes, I the recall, race. you know, he gave me a job. I got an apartment uh, for the Probably summer of 77 and moved up there. Um, Larry was one hell of a character besides being a, a great race car driver. But he gave me a job when I didn't deserve one. I, I wasn't a fabricator. I remember the first day uh, there, uh, he walked me over to a workbench, threw up a, a uh, upper A-frame jig on the, on the thing and said, build me some A-frames. And dude, I couldn't weld. My, my weld looked like, you know, turkey shit or something. It was terrible. Uh, but I did it and uh, and learned and, and uh, I, Hell, I remember uh, later on that summer That's when I was working there on Thursday before Friday night at Springfield on Thursday, he his race car had been sitting there since since Sunday, not touched. And he told me, he says, uh, change gear in my car, 
get it ready to race you Friday uh, Friday Gets night. So I zone. worked on his car, right changed there, the gear, and got right stuff ready. And then, uh, of course, my dad and Shaw brought, brought up my race hour. car, and we raced like hell. Uh, that night, but yeah, I've got great memories. Larry was uh, one hell of a character, funny, funny and guy. The bottom of the second, the Speaking of more memories, uh, another Twitter question at Volkman Todd Volkman asks, what are your favorite memories of fellow Ford racers, Davey and Alan? That would be Davey Allison and Alan Cook. Well, Davey was, uh, Davey was really a good dude. Um, his dad made him earn everything that, that he had in racing. Um, he was the solid kind of guy that you would expect from, from uh, Bobby and, and Judy. Um, just one heck of a fine young man, a fine fellow. Um, and Davey always treated me with tremendous respect, as did Bobby. Um, and, uh, you know, Davey and I shared a passion for uh, you know, for race cars, and he had a passion for airplanes as well, just like Bobby did. And when I got my first airplane, um, the first race I took it to was Dover. And when the race was over at the airport, uh, when we were getting ready to get in the plane, Davey come running over and said, I want to see it, I want to look at it. And he, climbed up inside and sat down and checked it out because he loved airplanes and uh, I remember that I, you know I just remember that like it was yesterday it was amazing gosh where'd I start on Alan um, there's a lot of stories on Alan um, I wouldn't say that Alan and I had a love-hate relationship but we had uh, a fierce competitiveness uh, and, a, and, a, and a reasonable friendship um, I helped Alan um, a couple, you know, a couple different ways. I know that when he was thinking about getting into NASCAR, in I was already running full time in 1982, and uh, uh, Alan called me up, was asking me questions. I said, "Well, come on down to the, to the Charlotte race, single. and you can stay at my house." Right there. How you and so Alan you comes to Charlotte, now, stays at my house with me. The next morning, we're going to get up and go to the racetrack. And he's going to follow me out there right now, this his guy, rental car. Really knows how to steal and so we're, he he grabs the driveway, the, the uh, newspaper out the driveway. The and anybody that knows nice Alan will, will chuckle at this story. So he's taking the newspaper and with him in the car. And we come to a traffic. Let's have a long drive to through town, Charlotte, through town to the speedway. We stop at a traffic light. And when it turns off. green, I take off, go across the intersection. I look back, Alan's still sitting in the road. Ain't moved, reading the newspaper. Traffic's the in, you know, he's blocking the traffic. And, and I have to pull over and wait for him to uh, get a, come on and get across the intersection. Um, and I don't know, that was just uh, funny to me. It doesn't sound funny unless you know Alan, but Alan was just a, he was the opposite of me. He was in granny low gear. I mean, he was a low gear kind of guy, but he was a thinker. And I'm a Tasmanian devil, bouncing off the wall, wide open. Don't think about nothing, just do it kind of guy. And Alan was a thinker. He always thought everything through. Um, he was so, you know, so smart in that way, and he was very methodical. And, uh, Alan and I, like I said, we had uh, we had uh, rivalry at times, and, and we had, uh, it, but we had, you know, mutual respect and, and some friendship sprinkled along in there. So. Go on to a different okay, subject now. Uh, Jake now point ask uh, Jake point five. What was your favorite sponsor in Rutgers? Oh, all of them. They were all fantastic. Um, you know, I, 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 I can't, uh, I can't say one was my favorite. I mean, fans know me as the legendary number six Valvoline race car driver, but and and Valvoline and I still have a uh, a relationship. After two and a half, still uh, still use her oil in all my vehicles. Um, but isn't it isn't it crazy after all the years and probably different ownerships and. 
uh, consolidations and things Filed like that with Valvoline, you still maintain a relationship with them. Yeah, it was really cool. We re rekindled the, the relationship a couple years ago. Um, because you know, in 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 my racing endeavors, on the ground. we uh, hey, transitioned to many motor oils uh, through the years. Uh, I, I drove a Pennzoil car, uh, I think a Quaker State car, um, you know, and and different things through the years. A but a couple years ago, we rekindled the relationship, did some uh, uh, legend uh, promotions with Abilene, and started uh, pouring Abilene at all of our five car dealerships and uh, proudly uh, pouring their, their oil. So, you know, that's a that's a legendary um, association that we had. But all my sponsors were fantastic, fantastic to work with. Um, I really enjoyed working with all of them. I really enjoyed working with the Army. What an amazing experience that was. Uh, you know, but uh, I had some great sponsors uh, as well at Hendrick Motorsports. And, and uh, through the years, the opportunity to work with AAA was fantastic. Um, all jokes aside, uh, working with Pfizer uh, was fantastic um, with the Viagra brand. But mostly, we did some really great work that I could really be proud of by promoting um, men's health and um, giving free health screenings to any fan that wanted to at all the racetracks the first year that they were involved they set up a mobile unit at the racetrack and uh, any you know encourage any men especially men over 40 to go get a checkup free checkup um you know because uh you know if you catch a, a health problem early it's much easier to treat than if you do like most men do uh which is keep grinding until you so you have a, a, a disaster, right here, sometimes it's much harder to treat that, those uh, those issues. So, you know, I just, uh, I, you know, I'm very, very fortunate through my years to work with a lot of great, great, great companies. Speaking of that, After now, you three, had a number of pizza teams. I know you like certain looks. I know you do. We've talked about this in the podcast. You had a favorite paint scheme of all time. Yeah, I think it was, uh, I believe it was 97. Um Ramirez the Valvoline car, the one. one where the, uh, instead of the straight um, and, and, uh, and, and bent corners, it was uh, sort of a ribbon. The V on the hood kind of came down the side, each side of the car like a ribbon. Fastball and that, that, that paint job, that paint scheme was my favorite. Uh, just really, really a sexy looking race car all right so going to back right. to even more questions here on twitter um, here's a real out there question from jay barker did you ever think about running a sprint car at any point in your career never crossed my mind um you know i was a stock car driver from day one on dirt and um and when i transitioned in my fourth season of transition to pavement racing um, I was done with dirt racing. Daytona, the Daytona 500 was not on dirt, so um, dirt fell off my radar screen uh, from a driving standpoint. Going back to 1987, Haley Emery asked, and I believe we covered this, touched on it a little bit. In 1987, you ran one cup race for Roger Hamby. Do you have any memories of that experience? Yeah, I do. Um, you know, I was running the full Bush uh, schedule in the 31 the car that, that uh, you can go back to that episode and listen to all that stuff. It was a very, uh, very well, hard working year. One of the one physically two. most demanding uh, years of my career. Um, and whoever was driving Rogers gun, car for, for I think it was the Coke 600, um, wasn't down. able to, Sometimes you, you know, had qualified the car, but wasn't able to race. And he right looked me up asked me if I'd run it and you know in, in 1980 in 1983 I would have just killed to have drove Roger's car um, I really did want to drive for him back then he was a mid-pack uh, uh, car really good running uh, overperforming race car under underfunded run a lot of used tires and a lot of stuff like that but um, you know so it was not a 
was not a contender kind of car, but it and was a car pit. that really overperformed, and many drivers drove his car as, uh, as, as stepping stones, uh, Lake Speed, and Sterling Marlin, and the so many others. And uh, so he came and got me and said, hey, uh, you want to run my car? And, you know, it paid, and I was there. Hell yeah, I want to run it. You know, and uh, I don't recall if I practiced the car. I guess I surely got in the car on Saturday um, and took took some laps in it. Um, but it was, a, you know, it was a car that run used engine parts and, and used pretty much everything. And we got in a race, and I think the engine broke early. So um, that's the story on that. It was just a, a fill-in situation, um, an opportunity to, to run an additional race. It wasn't an opportunity to, you know, go out there and show anybody what I could do. Um, you know, usually his equipment wasn't really that kind of equipment. It was uh, it was an overperforming mid-pack mid uh, funded operation. Uh, going back to uh, more memories, Doug Mallory asked on Twitter, which driver inspired you the most that brought out your very best and which driver was the thorn in your side during these racing years? Oh, gosh, that's a that's a tough one uh, on the on the thorn in my side. Um, I would say Mike Eddy in oh, ASA. Uh, we had very conflicting uh, driving styles and um, that all culminated in a, in a crash trying to win the, the dry power 400 the Winchester 400 in 1980 which was all on me it's my fault my mistake five laps to go passing him for the win trying to pass him for the win um, but he was tough he was a tough competitor a good dude Still loving, uh, but he was he was he was the he sort of the Dale Earnhardt of I ASA uh, from the standpoint of being able to really get tremendous results with his equipment and and was tenacious. Um, in NASCAR, I didn't have a thorn in my side. Uh, if it was, it was some overperforming drivers that one ball and one strike uh you know were not as skilled you know it caused wrecks i didn't like drivers that caused wrecks i just didn't and some of the guys that didn't run or didn't make it all the way to the top were a little bit accident prone because he drove over their head i didn't like that i didn't like drivers that drove over the head i didn't like drivers that that wrecked especially that took uh, took guys with him. Pitch taken for a ball. Uh, Earnhardt was not a thorn in my side. Um, he just was Three one balls, hell of a competitor no and would uh, crush you and beat you with a slower car and make you feel like dirt. Um, he did that to me a number of times. Um, later in my career, um, you know, I did. That didn't happen as often, but early in my career. He handed like he me my butt the strikes on there and uh, a number of times uh, with a with a slower race car, which was really uh, you know hard to take. Jackson looks at um, ball high. As far as uh, he could be going on this game. drivers that influenced me, Taken for a ball. I would say Trickle, Wayne Brooks, and no then Dick Trickle, then. Daryl Waltrip, then Bobby yeah. Allison, um, were that you know those the guys were instrumental in yeah. molding the, the driver and the person that I that I became. Um, Bobby was Bobby and Daryl both were especially interested in me in in different ways. Daryl Waltrip was an amazing man. Um, he took interest in me. He was very interested in late model racing. Even though he was winning NASCAR championships and stuff, Daryl never forgot where he came from. He can continue to race short track cars and ASA and those kind of things. He saw me coming. 
uh, we made a, a great friendship in 1980 when I got my feet and ankles busted up. Um, he came and drove my car for me. And uh, I told him before he came we were going to b break the track record and win the race. And I told him that not because I was optimistic, because I was positive that my car could do it and that I would do it if I wasn't hurt and that he would do it in my car. And we did just that. Against all odds, we, we, we did it. Um, and so all through the years, Daryl, tried to help me in the later years uh, we spent a lot of Bible studies together and that's not a swing um, in time in time Noah together the one -one in the motor coaches at, at the racetracks um, and it's inside. like that and and Bobby uh, was interested in me in a different kind of way it seemed like uh, Bobby was it. a big supporter of mine uh, one time when I was young it was 1983, Bobby told me. Uh, I was with him. I spent the week with him. And I was standing in his shop. And Bobby looked at me and he says, you know what the worst thing about you is? And I said, no. What? He said, you're mad. And I had tried to... That, that, that really impacted me. And... I still have a trash pitches, mouth, but I don't have a trash mouth like I did before. That had an impact on Going into the way the I spoke the fifth, the Yankees, um, and the words that I four. used. I was a product of my environment and didn't realize that not everybody spoke the way I spoke. I was 23 years old, and I needed to clean it up, so I did. Um, Bobby Nobody was a good out. dude. He told Jack Roush in 1987 when Jack contacted him about driving his new, newly formed race team race car for 1988. He told him he wasn't interested, but that he should get Mark Martin to drive that. So Bobby had uh, a hand in, in my uh, making it to the NASCAR Hall of Fame for sure. So speaking of that, that rolls into this next question from NASCAR guy 1982. Perez, when and where order. was the first time you met After Jack Roush? Five innings, the uh, hey, I remember four. there used to have something, some charity benefit in Chicago. And I met, met him in 1985 at that uh uh, because I was, uh, He's you know, I was an ASA champion, and, and I got invited to it. I went to that, and I met him Two after ball, that thing was over count. with. Sometimes I met with him for exactly uh, right for a little bit and got to talk to him. Yeah, and that was the first the time right I met side. him. Was at that function, and an uh, it was a charity raising event um, somewhere in Chicago. That was a long time ago. In, Sears announces the Wasilla store is closing forever. Millions in inventory must be sold, including all fashion clothing, tools, bed and bath, housewares, sporting goods, and more. Save 70% off on all fine gold, silver, diamond, and gemstone and jewelry. Gifts for all occasions. All in-store, in-stock major appliances are on sale. Everything must go. Even the store fixtures are for sale. Only in the Sears store in Wasilla at 1000 day, South Seward right Meridian Road. Country. It's business as usual at all other Sears stores. Sears announces the Wasilla store is closing forever. Millions in inventory must be sold, including all fashion clothing, tools, bed and bath, housewares, sporting goods, and more. Save 70% off on all fine gold, silver, diamond, and gemstone jewelry. Gifts for all occasions. All in-store, in-stock major appliances are on sale. Everything must go. Even the store fixtures are for sale. Only in the David, Sears store in Wasilla at 1000 South Seward Meridian stuff. Road. It's business as He's usual at all single. other Sears stores. Okay, I think this guy's come to the We're going to roll to like some short track questions. Of, of course, you know, and you speak fondly of the short track days, but we've got some very, One very pointed no questions. And, and kind of some of these came, have come through email over the last month. And as we've been doing these... Uh, year podcasts uh, by year okay, that first but um, hole in the I'm going to try to condense this a big bunch of questions that, that uh, come through uh, before you guys exit the 80s and enter the 90s please 
please have Mark mention how big of a deal it was during his short track career to win at places like the Minnesota State Fair, Lacrosse, Oktoberfest, Katana, Milwaukee Mile, Winchester, Elko Speedway, the Dells, and etc. That was cool. That was cool. Um, Minnesota Fair was cool. Oktoberfest, for some reason, was even cooler. I don't know why. I guess because it was just at, at the right time. It was 79. Um, it was a place where you would expect Wisconsin racers like Triple or Mike Miller or Tom Refner or one of those guys to win. Um, was a true feather in my cap. Uh, Milwaukee Mile was okay. It didn't have the history. I didn't feel like that some of the other the others Here's did. Pitcher, Franklin um, winning, uh, winning the national short track championship at Rockford, Illinois, at 18 years old, um, at that time was phenomenal. That was nobody could believe that a young a person that young could come and beat all those guys. You know, um, Jackson um, is ahead one and you know, real super hot shoes of, of short track racing up there at Rockford. That was one of the top five biggest wins of my career. And I go through that in some of the, the podcasts, but um, should have no problem. winning the, winning the, uh, the Arkansas State the Championship 50 lapper in uh, I-30 Speedway, getting Speed Bowl back in 1974, the first year I raced, was a Daytona 500 type of event for, for us to win. Then winning at Bolivar in 76 in the late model dirt car uh, was a Daytona 500 uh, type event, milestone event. Then winning the the National Short Track Championship in, at Rockford in 77 was certainly like winning the Daytona 500 or Indy 500 for us, it was unbelievable. Makes the catch um, for the out. Mm, to be real honest with you, those are the biggest wins in my career. And if it weren't for wins like those, no one would ever have seen me in this spot. So I view those as bigger. My career, the most important phase of my career is we've just done podcasts on my first year 74 through 1990 and as far as i'm concerned everything after that is second takes a back seat to what transpired leading up to that because that is the journey and without that there would have never been you know a nascar hall of fame uh, induction for me the same email from Steve, and he also asked, I don't know if you will recall this, could you please ask Mark to detail his wreck at Madison? So, uh, back then, Art, though, ran, uh, their, their program was, uh, you qualified, they inverted 12. Well, this is 1980, my car's stupid faster than everybody else's. So, I set fast time, um, started 12. And they run this particular day. I think they were running twin 50s and Burton 12 each time. And I was hauling up through the pack, and I caught Jim Sauter. And um, Jim was uh, was going into three, and I was coming fast. I got under him going into three, and he pinched me. And uh, you know I didn't turn him around because that's not what you did back then. Um, my I turned myself around. And here's the pitch and uh, slid to a stop at the bottom. And uh, Bob Strait uh, was, you know, was right there. There was nothing he could do. T-bowed -bo -bo me right in the foot uh, box. And as soon as, uh, as soon as we stopped, as soon as he hit me, there was no, I mean, I'm sitting there. Uh, like, I know, oh man, I just, broke my feet and I look up and here, here comes Mike Miller he parks his car gets out of it comes running you know 
I mean, it's like it wasn't red flagged or nothing. You know, here the comes my stirring, so he just um, wants to come out and give the bullpen to check some on more me. time. I'm telling man, my feet broke. And, uh, oh, man, bringing in the righty right here is a good move because right handed hitters uh, can have trouble. They got me out. Put me on a stretcher. They had called uh, somehow or another a military helicopter was in the area doing a, you know, doing some kind of work. And so the helicopter, they, they, they landed that military helicopter and they, they loaded me onto, onto the helicopter and flew me to Madison General. Um, landed on top of Madison General, I think on top. Um, and took me in right here to move double play depth. and you know I waited for my surgery and, and when my surgery's over over with and my doctor comes in to see me you know he tells me about my injuries and I tell him I says well you know I have I'm going to race again in 30 days Thompson will take a seat. so do Strike you know three. so have that in our plan he says you're not going to race again this year I said, I'm going to race again in 30 days. And that was the end of our conversation about it. I found out that he was uh, Eric and Beth Hyden's father. That one's deep, uh, and it's who, who were uh, Olympic figure skaters. So he knew a, a little something about, you know, sports and, and uh, you know, what it took to, to make it to the top. So he never, we never had another discussion. Um, he sent me, sent me away, sent me home. And uh, uh, three weeks later, I come in for my checkup. He cuts the cast off of my foot. And I tell him, Doc, I got it all fixed. I got a can clutch. I'm going to right foot gas and brake. And because my left foot was broken four places. And uh, I'm going to, you know, I got a hand clutch. I'm going to right foot brake and gas. I'm all set, all good to go. I thought he was going to cut the cast off and put a new cast on. Well, he cut the cast off, said, stand up. And it scared the shit out of me. The reliever's not ready, so the manager is going said, out to the mound said, stand to stand up. some more time. Stand up. Like walk time out of here. And I said, no, no, I, I got a hand clutch and everything. I, 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 you can put a, you know, Bring put a cast right back on. Right he says, no, partner. it'll heal faster out of the cast. And I stood up and walked out of there. It was freaking unbelievable. Hurt like hell. But he sent me on my way. And then the story goes, that was uh, the, the 30 days later, I guess the next week, I go to Milwaukee with a hand clutch in the car and right foot braking, which I'd never done in my life in a race car, and sat on the pole and won the race. I had an epic battle with Trickle at the end. Uh, multiple, strikeout. multiple restarts. And he was just dogging the hell out of me. It was a major win. And then we went... Uh, Score seven, that half inning. Then we went on to Cayuga for the weekend. And uh, it was a, a 300 there, I think. And we sit on the pole and run second to Junior Hanley up there. And the so... I made, we made a, made a hell of a return in 30 days. We're going to move to some setup questions. Uh, a lot of people are very interested in your setups and your knowledge uh, of your race cars. So we have a question from Scooter Allison. He says, I love listening to this podcast. One of my favorite aspects is hearing Mark's setup info from different races and how he remembers percentages and spring rates from 30 to 40 years ago. As a setup question, what does spring split do when used versus using the same springs across the rear or front? Hey, I, you know, I have issues. You know, there. I, you know, I, I'm a, I'm a real messed up person. Uh, you know, when I can't remember flip. There's a line drive. Uh, but especially when I was young, the most important thing in my life was uh, making the fastest race car, winning race car. And I did all the, I, I dreamed up the setups, I tried the setups, I put them in the car, I did it all, 
as far as those setups go. I did all the dreaming up. I did all the studying. Uh, every time I saw Darrell Waltrip, even when I got to NASCAR in 1982, I asked him, what springs you got? What springs you got? I mean, it's uh, just... And I remember. I remember the percentages. I remember I remember all those things from, from 70. 7, 78, 79, 80, you know, and, and you know, even that far back, if you show me a picture of a car at a certain racetrack and, and I recognize what track it is, then I can recognize what race it is. And then I, then my memory, it's just there. It's just like a setup sheet in my mind. It's weird. I, spring split, uh, you know, there's no... Uh, I don't, I don't, I'm not smart enough stop. to give you an answer. Um, Got him at first in, uh, the with the heavy left side weight cars, uh, we fought loose all the time. The cars turned incredibly well. We're loose all the time. So we ran a lot of spring split in the, in the rear, meaning the right rear had to be really soft. Right the right rear and speed. left rear had to be really stiff. They make the play at first. Um, we ran paired up springs in the front uh, during that era, you know, heavy left, 60, 61, 62% left side weight era. But as we went forward um, and they started taking left side weight away, and then they changed, uh, made a change and downsized the cars and shortened up the wheelbase, those cars didn't turn as well. And we evolved from a pair of 400s in the front to a 350, 300 across the front, the 300 in the left front. For some reason, that softer left front probably just just uh, let the car feel a little softer, let it turn on the caster, front end caster uh, setup that you had and everything, just let it, let it turn a little bit more. And we went from running like a 200 left rear and a 125 right rear to a pair of 175s. That was just to get it to turn better uh, and those are just the kinds of things you do I mean um, you know we He's got in a NASCAR we ran equal front and rear springs in 88 um, cars were really fast but fell off the tires then in 89 we got split the springs up like everybody else running like an 1800 and a 1200 across the front inch and eighth bar and a 400 in the right rear and a 350 in the left rear 10 and a half, 11 and a half track bar. Uh, that setup would stay on the tires longer and was, uh, but that wasn't anything new. That was copying everybody else, what everybody else ran at the time. So uh, a lot of people ran 14, most people ran 1400s in the left front instead of a 12 with the 18 in the right on the mile and a half and stuff. I always liked the softer left front for some reason. I felt like my car drove better seven innings, uh, it's a seven they said the bigger time. left front turned better i did not find that i never i never saw the car turn better with the bigger left front so i never i never was big from 1989 on i never was i never liked a big right front a left front spring in a car rusty you know almost everybody ran you know, 20% more left front of spring than I did Sometimes all through those years. Exactly Another question from right Brandon here. Whedon. I've seen lots There's of pictures from the 80s and 90s, and the spoilers seem to be Base almost completely laid down. Can you explain the pros and cons of that and what the rules were regarding that? Uh, there wasn't any rear spoiler rule at the time, and that you're seeing that basically at Daytona and Talladega. Um, you know, and it's uh, right after a stricker plate. So you go from 650 to 700 horsepower to down to right 400. So, and so drag became an issue. Drag was not an issue at 700 horsepower around Daytona. It wasn't a big issue because you had to, still had to handle because you had so much power. You could make so much speed. So you put more spoiler on it for more downforce so you could handle through the turns. When they choked off the motors, uh, you could run wide open easy. And so as you would push the spoiler back, you would take downforce off the car, but you would take considerable drag off the car. And so you would you would pick up speed. 
it would get a little bit harder to handle in the turns. To to first base. But it was, you know, it was all in your hands. The driver uh, could tell the team, two. yeah, I'm going to have to have sport, more spoiler for tomorrow or let's leave it laid back. Or during a race, you could pit stop and they'd run back there and knock it up, bend it up a little bit. It was a cool time. Uh, when the cars handled when the cars made, you know, let's say 400 this horsepower, 400, somewhere around there, and Daytona and Talladega, and you just didn't need, you needed that speed more than you needed the, the stick. You see a little bit of that in today's rules package when they talk about, you know, the downforce in the, the car Sox, at cars at the, at the intermediate tracks because picture. they're down at 450 horsepower, or what, at 500 horsepower, I guess it is. And at 500 horsepower at Charlotte, for example, you, if you put maximum downforce on the car and a lot of drag, it takes enough speed out of the car that a lot of teams put a midways, you know, compromise and take a bunch of that downforce off and pick up the speed. And then they just fight it more, getting it through the turns. And the, it all comes down to who has the best mechanical uh, set up if you've got a, a mechanical Next setup up, that really Thompson. works good you can take downforce off the car and and it's make more and uh, straightaway speed and still not give up a lot of handling the so at the end of the day the cars the still have the, the greatest advantage the that have the have best handling because they can get it. by with less best handling from a uh, mechanical standpoint because you can get by with a little less downforce, a little bit, a little less to drag. For some reason, I don't remember, for some reason, 1260, 1262, something like that. I don't remember for sure. Um, but for some reason, that number sticks out in my head. Uh, from qualifying time, um, a 350, 300, pair of 175s in the back, 350 in the right front, 300 left front, inch and three eighths hollow front bar, uh, two o'clock panner bar. It's uh, a pretty high panner bar, 56% cross to probably two. Spool in the rear and probably two, somewhere between two and a quarter and two and a half he inches of rear stagger, somewhere side. somewhere in that range. Whatever oh, left side weight the rule was, you know, probably around 56%, something like that. Um, then 51% uh, rear weight, between 50 and a half and 51% rear weight. Um, and those are the the high points of, of that setup. That would have been, um, it was probably 86 that we ran, that we won the 300 there. Might have been 85. Uh, but that setup kind of coincides with with that, uh, that Ford one and two. that I had there, Gunderman Ford. But so far, the every year that I went there, the pole was in the high 12s. Um, you know, and, and uh, first time I took the Dillon car there, we ran a pair of 500s and a 200 and a 150 across the back, 200 and a left, 150 across the back. Uh, but it, but that car had more like 60, you know, 60% left side weight, 62% probably left side weight. So ran a, ran a bunch of different setups, uh, ran conventional coils there and 77, the 78, inning, 79. And it's still anybody's ball game. And run the, the coilovers and, and 80 and, and beyond. So we're going to stay on the theme of specific products as you're talking. And uh, Curtis Vanderwall has a question in email. He says, Mr. Martin, it seems as though throughout your NASCAR the career you had a great relationship with Simpson Race products and used them exclusively. Can you talk a little about that relationship and why you choose to use their products? Bill Simpson. Uh, I mean, if you do your history on Bill Simpson or you read his book and you find out what kind of character he was, 
uh, as a person, um, as a race car driver, uh, and involving into the, the safety field as a necessity. Um, you know, being a race car driver necessitated uh, him to get into the, the safety field because there was so, so much room for improvement in those years. So um, I'm a big supporter of Bill Simpson uh, personally and, uh, and Simpson racing products and the things that he did and the things he developed and then going forward, uh, you know, Butch Stevens uh, taking over, I think, uh, Simpson products. Um, Butch was a, a friend of mine and he was my spotter in the early years at, uh, at Roush's. He actually spotted for me. He's headed to second. So he's a good dude. Another There's product question coming in from Steve There's on email. He's up Mark talking about his all all history time. of using Dixiana racing seats. While everyone was using Brian Butler seats and others, he always had the old style short track type seat. Yeah, so um, I got to use the Dixiana seats got the on second, um, got after I got out of the fiberglass the seats. Hit the left field. Well, first, that it was a fiberglass seat that looked similar to uh, a butler seat strategy. with no, no so uh, are supports on them. We used to buy them from Ed Howe, fiberglass seats. And uh, and, and so and Dixiana started making them out of eighth-inch aluminum. No braces on them, just bent up eighth inch aluminum and I raced in those things you'd hit something no and I swing. thought it was thought it was the right thing to do because I thought it didn't break your ribs and stuff you know the rib support Rob in the Dixiana seat would just side. open right up it would just bend and open right up I thought that was a good thing at the time coming up through the years so when that was up through my ASA a days and then Liner when I got into NASCAR you know, I continued to use the same seat I'd been driving in because I was used to it. And so I was going to Daytona and Talladega with eighth-inch bent-up aluminum seat. We started adding a little bit of bracing to them um, through the years because they were getting where they bent too easy. But we didn't ever get them really stiff. And I stayed in those things until... Uh, Man, I don't even know when I finally made made the switch to to uh, Butler, but when I did, they were they really were so comfortable. Uh, God, I had those seats right, and then um, and so I stayed in those seats until I got with uh, Hendrick, and Hendrick was the manufacturer of all those carbon seats. It's taken for a ball. I didn't want to in the worst way. I did not want to to use a carbon seat, but you know, it was the right thing to do because I was a Hendrick driver and all the Hendrick guys, you know, ran them. They gave me the option, but it would have I would have been an ass to not not do it. So they had to make a, a new uh, seat for me. They didn't have one sh short, small enough for me, so they they had to do a new uh, mold for for He's a seat a small enough for me, play. and they wound up using that no for Kelly Byers and Danica wound up using that as well, uh, a few others, but not many people small enough the from oh, the butt up. You know, I've got the really long legs, really long legs for a short dude, but, you know, um, it's real easy for me to get my head in my ass because it don't have far to go. Another question from David Weikert uh, on email. He says, we just had the second Roval race last weekend, which in my opinion was great to watch. This game's headed As for someone who innings. has had success at Charlotte Motor Speedway After and on the road courses, seven to seven what time. is your thoughts well, this, is this is a, as a fan? And how do you feel as it, uh, how do you feel if it had been on the schedule when you were driving? Well, I love racing on road courses. Um, I think that uh, the schedule could stand more. Uh, I love watching this Roval race. Seemed like there was a lot of passing to me this, this past race. Seemed, seemed fun, seemed good. As a driver, it's not important what I think or what I would thought or whatever, because I'm not anymore. Uh, I'm a fan, just like the rest of, of you guys. And I thought it was awesome. Loved it, a lot of action. Great race, and uh, 
I, I, you know, I applaud. I applaud him. I was uh, somewhat disappointed that we lost the race off the over at Charlotte because I think it's one of the greatest races on, on, on our schedule, racetracks on our schedule, and I love it. But we still have the 600, and, uh, you know, oval track racing's not going away. And we needed more road courses, and that was the only way we could get a road course is to take one away, uh, take an oval away. So uh, I'm good with it. Last question down. for this uh, fan podcast for the episode. Boss Cartwright on Twitter asked, where do you see the health of short track base. racing and where can improvements be made? I think short track racing is on an upswing right now. Uh, asphalt strategy in mind. racing so the is not really on an upstream. Maybe it is on an ups upswing, but it's, it's, it's not very healthy right now. Um, whereas dirt track racing is 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 pretty healthy and on an upswing and and really look I really things really look op optimistic. Um, pavement racing is just a challenge. It's uh, it's just a challenge right now, and, and there's not any great answers. Both dirt and asphalt need uniform uh, rules, which. Dirt have for the late model dirt cars they have they have a, a good set of, of, of rules that that seem to be pretty universal and that's really fantastic. Uh, you need to get away from on pavement racing. You need to get away from fifty thousand dollar engines, um, and you. You need uniform rules. That's that's where I see the fragmented rules. You know, late models, uh, crate late models, um, you know, all different rules, um, modified asphalt, you know, all these different things. You need a for affordable, good series that you can take a car and run from and East Coast to West Coast. Rivera Anywhere you want to race it, relief. it'll be competitive because the rules are close enough to the same that you can take it and run. We need that in, 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 in multiple, multiple divisions for pavement racing. Um, the modifieds the under are doing well. Personally, I would still like to see the UMP rules and the... And the uh, and the other rules, all, all the I'd I like to see those guys get together, um, because I just a just think that, like when we had the race for hope uh, in baseball, and we had the IMCA mod rules, all a lot of the UMP guys didn't come and run, and because the rules are enough different that they didn't feel like their cars, you know, wasn't worth it to them. And if you had, there are so many uh, IMCA modifieds and UMP modifieds in this country. The if they were all two. one, relatively, if they could all agree on a compromise for rules, for everything from tires to engines to well, whatever the frame difference, you know, any difference there time. is, okay, body, bad, whatever, then the uh, one guy could take that his car foul. and run anywhere in the United play. States and know that he his car was on the money, that, w innings, that, that would be good. Seven seven um, that's the biggest thing, is controlling the cost. And that's why dirt modifieds are so popular, because the costs are contained really well in that division. And, um, and we need that on, on pavement. We need a, a racing organization or a racing series kind of car rules package that runs all over the country that is the same same rules so that'll do it for episode number 32 of the mark martin sure podcast again hit us up on the website markmartinpod.com or markmartinpod.com make sure to subscribe on your favorite podcast player and leave us that five star rating thank you for subscribing and listening to the mark martin podcast remember to give us a five star rating in your app store Connect with us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at Mark Martin POD. The Mark Martin Podcast is a production of the Accelerated Podcast Network. He just got a piece of that one. 
Sears announces the Wasilla store is closing forever. Millions in inventory must be sold, including all fashion clothing, tools, bed and bath, housewares, sporting goods, and more. Save 70% off on all fine gold, silver, diamond, and gemstone jewelry. Gifts for all occasions. All in-store, in-stock major appliances are on sale. Everything must go. Even the store fixtures are for sale. Only in the Sears store in Wasilla at 1000 South Seward Meridian Road. It's business as usual at all other Sears stores. Race fans, it's time to buckle in and listen to the fastest hour in racing radio. Your driver is a multi-time NASCAR winner and Hall of Famer, Mark Martin. We cover racing, grassroots, history, we bench race, we talk life, and most importantly, we smash the loud pedal. It's time to turn some laps on the Mark Martin Podcast. Stepping in one for four. Episode number 31 of the Mark Martin Podcast, and we're going to get into the year ninth. 1990, a uh, year of many firsts uh, along the way. But before we get to that, make sure to hit markmartinpod.com, markmartinpod.com. Get all of the old podcasts. Subscribe to us on various podcast players. Make sure to give us that five-star rating. But, Mark, as you said, this is a landmark, a bookmark. This is a huge year for you, 1990. Let's talk about it. Like I've explained in the other podcasts, um, but I want to go over it again. You know, uh, people's recollections of things are the way they perceive them. They're what they see. They're what they believe. They're always biased in, into, you know, what, what they think and what they what they see. I'm no different. Um, but I believe that I'm a very fair person. And I'll go over some of the conspiracy theories and, and some of the broken uh, heartedness of uh, 1990. Um, in many ways, it is uh, it is one of my uh, well, it's it's my coming out party. It's when I finally start to heal. And if you've been listening to the previous podcast, you'll hear. Um, I finally start healing from the disappointments uh, and and heartache and and uh, and everything that I had to go through through the 80s um, to get back to NASCAR. We finally got our first win in October of '89, and uh, been so close for so long, and now we get to go into the season fresh with a fantastic season under our belt running third in the points, which should have been second, but we blew up in the last race. Ah, uh, so, so we were third. So, um, man, we're, we're charged up and ready to go. Um, we take a little bit different approach. Uh, we're going to do a good bit, you know, do a good bit less testing, but plenty of testing. Uh, because testing was still allowed back then, but not nearly as much as we, we tested ourselves to death in, in 1989. Um, we learned a lot, and uh, we were applying them and um, uh, better prepared. It would be our third year uh, since the formation of Roush Racing, and uh, we were just much, much better prepared um, going into the season. We went to Daytona, and Daytona was a typical Daytona. Uh, I don't remember. Uh, I would remember if it was good, so um, that's why I say it was typical. Um, they always called uh, Daytona uh, the world world center of racing, and I called it the world center of pain. Um, I de- desperately disliked the place. Um, Probably uh, more and more the more I raced there. Um, 1988, I guess I didn't care. 1989, I should have won the the July race at Daytona. Had everybody totally killed, totally killed my car out, handled everybody's car by a ton. And uh, we ran it out of gas with uh, 25 miles to go. So... Um, I'm sure whatever disappointment we had at Daytona was was normal. And we go to, I I believe the second race uh, was Richmond back then. We go to Richmond, and race day is cold. I'm talking about cold and windy and blowing and snowing. It was dusting snow. And uh, so we got ready to start the race, and Jack and his his wisdom 
of uh, engines was scared for that cold air to get to the engine. So he had uh, the boys tape the cow uh, shut. And so it was only pulling air from underneath the hood, you know, hot engine air into the carburetor. And that thing wouldn't run a lick. I mean, I can't believe it. You know, it was just really, really, really down on power when we started the race. So when we got a chance to pit, the first thing it is rip that tape off. Now we're back, got our power back. Now we're back Stepping going, so four, uh, he gets down toward the late, late stages of the race, and um, and the last pit stop comes, and you know we're not going to win. Um, we're probably going to run second to Earnhardt, up and, and Steve territory. Meal but he has room for a makes a call, two tires, the next is and he put me out in front of Dale, and uh, I set sail on the restart. Um, and we won the race and uh, did victory lane. Oh, so cold, bitter cold, spitting he snow. We did victory lane, did all the stuff. And uh, Arlene and I piled up in the car and I drove back to Greensboro. And uh, I'm at my house in Greensboro and I get a phone call from a media it's member a uh, wanting to get a quote about uh, our penalty Line that I knew nothing about yet. Um, He's on so, you know, started trying to find out what happened. Well, what happened after ball. I left the Back racetrack ball. was no being they say, they meaning people that talk to me that, okay, you know, I believe, you know, people close to me who would be allies of mine, who might be biased, but they say that Richard Childress pointed out to the NASCAR officials that the thing had a two and a half inch carburetor spacer on it. And uh, the rule was two inch carburetor spacer. Back up a little bit, back in the shop. I'm told that uh, when Robin Pemberton uh, was uh, finishing up the car to go up there, um, put the air cleaner on it, closed the hood. Um, this was a very light short track car, lightweight. The hood was flimsy, and the air cleaner is supposed to push up against the hood. And for whatever reason, this you know, there was a gap in the hood. He noticed the hood would push down really easy, so he took it apart and he put a two and a half inch spacer on it, had a two inch spacer, put a two and a half inch spacer on it. Hood fit perfect, wasn't any problem because all year. Um, the year before they NASCAR had been allowing teams to weld to the top of the intake manifold because one of the other manufacturers had a real tall manifold built so it was unfair to the other manufacturers so they just started letting you weld you know the, the thing as tall as you want it so in Robin's mind it didn't matter anymore what the carburetor spacer was because you could be as high as you wanted in of reality, you could have welded it on to the top of the manifold, and we wouldn't have got right got field. penalized. But as he it turns out, uh, that. a rare occasion that Bill France Jr. didn't go to the racetrack, which may or may not have made a difference, uh, was communicated. He was back in Daytona, Oak, from what I understand, and he was communicated with and with all this problem. They got a two and a half inch rubber special. Rule book says two. Yeah, you could say that. You didn't have anybody arguing saying, no, nah, we've been letting them weld onto the car, you know, onto the manifold. He got the information that we had a two and a half inch carburetor spacer in the rule was two. And he said, put them at the tail end of the lead lap. And they did. So that, that cost us 46 points and fined us, I don't know, a bunch of money too. Uh, which came right out of, you know, since we didn't, since we had to pay that fine, I didn't get, get paid for that race, which mattered a lot to me because I still was fairly broke, uh, young family man. And so that was incredibly disappointed. I'd won a race. We didn't get paid. Uh, and, you know, they've done this and taken the 46 points. Conspiracy theorists say 
NASCAR took that championship away from us because they didn't like Jack because he was a northerner and and because they wanted Earnhardt to win the championship because Richard Childress was super tight with uh, Bill France because Richard was one of the very few that raced at, at uh, Talladega at his first race when all the drivers boycotted. And so Richard, uh, uh, Bill French Jr. always loved Richard and watched out for him. And Richard's a good guy, a good guy, good racer, good, he's a racer. And so that's a conspiracy theory. I didn't say that. I'm just telling you what people say. I'll tell you right now that I don't believe that there's any way that NASCAR could have known, that Bill France could have known, that we would even contend for a championship. So, in, in the second race of the season. Okay, so that's bullshit. So, uh, the bottom line is that we got penalized for something that we probably shouldn't have got penalized for that we may or may not have got penalized for He's if with a single. Bill would have been at the racetrack and, and Jack and Robin position. and Steve could have pled their case. Um, at the end of the day, uh, we were not able to, uh, you know, to plead our case effectively We're and right we Felix got that Robert fine Williams. and we moved forward. We shook it off. Uh, we continued to have a good season, marched on forward. Uh, really fast, really, really strong. Um, we went to Sonoma, which is usually in, I don't know, around the 1st of June. And we hauled butt there. Uh, if I, you know, it may may not have been this year, but I think I ran second to Ernie out there. It might have been a different year. Uh, but we hauled butt. We left, left Sonoma leading the points around, around the 1st of June early June or something and we led the points the whole season um, until very late in the season and I'll get to that in a minute um, Earnhardt and I uh, had a epic battle at North Wilkesboro um, we uh, uh, and this is probably this is getting down probably close to October close to the 1st of October because it was right before the Charlotte race in October. So we go to North Wilkesboro. We sit on the outside pole, I believe. Um, we start the race. We've got a, I believe we've got a 1200 in the right front with a rubber. And uh, we start the race and we're on radials. Radials had, you know, were fairly new to us. Um, and by, you know, so, so the radials were throwing us a little bit of a curve. We start to race, and we're the tight, and we're tight, and we're tight. Ready in the pen. And, um, you know, there's probably six cars in the lead lap on the last pit stop late, late in the race. I'm going to say there's 60 laps to go, uh, something like that, 50 to go. And Steve Mill makes another brilliant call. Steve Mill was amazing on. on the pit box. What a, what a great guy, great friend, smart. Uh, I, I wish that Steve and I still work together. I wish I could go in to, to work with Steve all the time. Uh, the dude is just so smart. He inspires me. Anyway, he makes the call. We're going to pull the rubber out. Well, they like to never got the rubber out. Of course, we went out last on the lead lap. There might have been 10, 10 cars in the lead lap. I don't know how many of the were. You know, we went to, toward the back on the restart. And, of course, Earnhardt's up front. And, now and we, up through the green, we march up through there. Oh, baby, did it ever fix that car. Man, that son of a buck was right. And uh, we drove up through there. And with probably, I'm going to guess, 20 to go, we catch Dale. And I turn down underneath him in, in one. He don't leave much room, but there's enough room for one car to fit underneath him. I turn underneath him, drive up to his door, and... Uh, just give him a little little rub donut in the door and jam the gas and we come up off of two side by side and i remember i i could see the grandstands the fans on the back on the fence and everything just going nuts i mean i saw stuff flying and everything 
I caught that out of the corner of my eye. Just people going nuts in their stands. And uh, we drive down the back stretch, and I clear him. We go into three and four. And uh, he rolls up, pokes me in the ass. And right when he hit me in the back bumper, I jammed the gas to the floor. Drove it up out of the corner and drove off. And uh, and that was it. We won that race. And uh, we served notice. That was win number two for the season. Um, Earnhardt had been winning a few more races. But we had been so consistent and so good that... Uh, that we were still leading the points. We served notice that we were serious about that championship. Sears announces the Wasilla store is closing forever. Millions in inventory must be sold, including all fashion clothing, tools, bed and bath, housewares, sporting goods, and more. Save 70% off on all fine gold, silver, diamond, and gemstone jewelry. Gifts for all occasions. All in-store, in-stock major appliances are on sale. Everything must go. Even the store fixtures are for sale. Only in the Sears store in Wasilla at 1000 South Seward Meridian Road. It's business as usual at all other Sears stores. What makes a business a business? It's not the circumstances of a world that woke up on the wrong side of the bed that year, that decade. It's the everyday entrepreneur ready to put themselves out there. We're all sailing against the wind right now, but we will make it to shore. It's been done before, and we will do it again. To help you get started, we're offering websites, marketing tools, and guidance all for free. Learn more at GoDaddy.com. We went on to Charlotte, and uh, I believe Earnhardt ran the wheels, made a pit stop, and one of his and left the pits, and one of the wheels came off, and I don't know some some of my team guys were crying and bitching because they let him go down there or something jack it up put a wheel on it or something uh, you know they always were afraid that you know those guys were getting shown favoritism and you know they they should have they were I mean Richard Childress had earned the, the right to to be to have to be treated uh, really 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 well and Earnhardt was uh Man, he was the lifeblood of. I mean, he was filling the stands because the stand, the, the half the people came there to see Earnhardt win, and the other half came to see him get beat. Um, he was just uh, he was a polarizing figure, and and uh, anyway, Earnhardt had trouble. Man, we're we're looking good in our points, and we go on down. Back then, the next to last race was Phoenix. And then the last race was Atlanta. And we go to Atlanta. I think we go to Atlanta before Phoenix and we test. And we take three race cars, three of our cars. And you remember me telling, if you've listened to these other ones, you know, we were typically down on power, about 50 horsepower uh, at that time to uh, at least to Robert Yates. I, I don't. I can't say for sure about the Chevy guys, um, but our cars were really good. We were building really good cars, uh, fair on aero, extremely good on, you know, mechanic mechanically as far as lightweight. And we were really good with our suspensions, really good with our setups, really stayed on our tires good, ran smart races. Steve Mill called brilliant races so we were we were in good shape so we go to this test with three cars Earnhardt shows up at the test he runs about an hour and a half and he calls ass and he tells them he's good to go and he leaves and goes hunting and they put their stuff up and go home they serve notice they think they're ready they think they're psyching us out which they're not. We're just we're testing all our stuff to see which car's the best. And uh, so I think Davey was going to be late getting there. I don't remember exactly what the deal was. And there's like, take Davey's car out. So sure. So we'll throw the rags in the thing, and I go out. And uh, the first lap by, I'm like 15 one hundredths quicker than we've run in my car. And, you know, it's like, it's a ton, ton of motor. I mean, he's making 700 horsepower at this time, and we're making 
you know, 645. And all I'm told is, is that dinos aren't the same, you know, and that Robert's dino's jacked up and the numbers, you know, you make them read whatever you want to make them read. And the one's in North Carolina and one in Michigan. But there was a significant horsepower difference. The car really wasn't any better, but it probably wasn't worse. Um, it was probably fairly equal, but the motor thing was fantastic. We needed everything that we could get to try to make sure we won this championship. So we made the decision, and Jack blessed it, that just let me have that, let me have that car. With the car included the motor for that race. Robert was fine to help afford, you know, they couldn't win that year, and they were going to try to help us help a Ford team win, win the championship. So we all agreed on it. We are going to borrow uh, – one of Davy's cars that I ran quicker than I did in my cars with. And, uh, you know, for that final race, we still got a nice, nice point lead. So we wrap that up and, uh, I don't feel psyched out at all. I just, we're making the best decisions we can under the circumstances. And, uh, and, and so we head out to Phoenix and we hit Phoenix, man. And we just don't run. I mean, we just don't handle. We can't handle. We can't handle. We can't handle. We qualify. I don't know. Not as good as we usually did. And uh, we just didn't run good. Didn't run like we usually run. Uh, Run much worse than usual. And I don't know what the problem was. But back then, you got five-point bonus for sitting on the pole and five-point bonus for leading the most laps. And unbelievably, Earnhardt sat on the pole, which is unusual for him to do. He didn't sit on many poles. And he led the most laps. And we floundered and we pitted and we put tires on and we put tires on and we put tires on and we just could not move up. It's one of the first times that I really remember that track position was so freaking critical. And the thing was, is we weren't making downforce back then. We had that car had lift in the front and race trim and maybe 150, 200 pounds of downforce in the back. It wasn't anything special, probably a couple hundred pounds of downforce in the back, maybe. So it wasn't aero that was killing us. It just, it was just all the cars were so close to the same speed that no one could make a different lane and make anything happen. And I just, we just kept pitting and trying to put tires on and tires just wouldn't help. And we just hung around 10th and we finished 10th and Earnhardt won. And he just erased that nice point cushion that we had. And we went into, we went into Atlanta in the final race and we ran good. We qualified in the top 10 and we ran in the top 10. We finished sixth. Sixth isn't bad. Um, but it wasn't good enough. Earnhardt ran about third, and uh, we lost the championship by 20 points. Uh, actually, we lost it, I think, by 26 points. So conspiracy theorists said that we would have won the championship if we hadn't got screwed on that one penalty that we really didn't have coming, which is true. Uh, we didn't have it coming that we would have won the championship by 20 points. But here's what I say. We didn't. We didn't score enough points to overcome the penalty, and we got the penalty in the second race of the season. The best thing to do is put your big boy pants on, man up, and move forward. And that's exactly what, you know, yes, when when Atlanta was over with, I was disappointed, but I wasn't crushed because I was just getting started. And there was plenty of championships out there in front of me. And I had won three more races, so um, which was really my main objective. Um, you know, if you've listened to all these other podcasts, my you know my life's dream was to finally win a cup race, and we finally did that in '89, and then we added three more to the to the total in '90. Set on some more poles, run really fast, and had everybody's attention. So, well, made a tremendous run at the championship, and I was proud of of our effort and everything that we did. Um, There's a lot of people that criticize us for uh, making the the 
28, borrowing the 28 car in the last race. But I would have had to, you know, I would have had a pretty much won the race with Earnhardt finishing where he did. You know, I'd had to, I would have had to run significantly better than I did. Um, you know, I would have had to, I would have had, you know, probably run, beat him and run third or something, second or third with him running that good. They just turned it on. Um, they just were hot when they needed to be. We had a comfortable lead until we got to, to Phoenix, the next last race. And we failed to perform at that one race outside of that. We did, you know, an incredible job. So I was really, you know, looking into 91, um, uh, with, you know, I will get it. We'll get it this, you know, the next year. And that's kind of the attitude I had. But once we get into 91, we'll talk a little bit about that. Um, it did have a, a negative effect. I think it had a negative effect on our, uh, performance. We'll talk about it. We got behind on our arrow in 91. Um, uh, I had, you know, probably stepped back a little bit from pushing our guys, um, to be a better leader. Sometimes you, you can't tell people what to do.